Hey there, brother. Thanks for tuning in. We're talking today about one of the strangest trends in motorcycle history, choppers, baby. Whether you love them or you hate them, they're somehow unavoidable. What should have been an esoteric niche within the motorcycle world, choppers have somehow managed to permeate most corners of pop culture throughout the last 60 years. They're in movies, they're in TV shows, and there is even a big dog chopper collecting dust in your dentist's garage. Your normie coworker surely could not differentiate a hypermotard from a Hayabusa, but even your grandpa, who went partially blind from drinking too much moonshine, can identify a chopper by the abstract silhouette and contorted lines. So what the hell even is a chopper, where do they come from, and why does the style refuse to die? All that and more on today's episode of Easy Rider Dude, Chopped and Screwed, Yammy Noob. Let's get into it. So what even is a chopper? Sure, most people will recognize one when they see it, but for a style of motorcycle that is meant to prioritize individuality and the freedom of expression, there are kind of a lot of rules as to what a chopper should and shouldn't have. Spoiler alert, brakes and suspension are optional. Choppers were originally a type of motorcycle that was custom built that was typically heavily modified from the original design of the bike. Choppers originated in the United States in the 1940s and gained popularity in the 60s and 70s, but but unlike bobbers, cafe racers, or scramblers, which were all heavily modified bikes built to improve speed, performance, or off-road capability, most of the modifications to a chopper are purely for aesthetic purposes rather than for functionality. In the birth of a tragedy, Nietzsche poses that humans use the aesthetic illusion to make the truth of their reality bearable. In relation to choppers, we can believe that the average chopper builder thinks, if we put tons of time and energy into this beautifully pinstriped paint job, no one will care that this bike threatens the life of the rider every time it reaches speeds faster than a mobility scooter. Vague aphorisms aside, a quintessential chopper usually encompasses a specific framework pun intended. One of the most distinct features of a chopper is a very raked out front end. The angle of the head tube of the frame is modified in a way where the forks extend far out in front of the bike. This rake can be so aggressive that a civilian would think, hey, that looks different. And the average motorcycle rider would say, hey, that looks dangerous. These bikes often use Springer front ends. The Springer motorcycle fork is a pretty rudimentary design that is commonly found on chopper motorcycles. With a Springer front end, the fork tubes are rigid, unlike conventional telescopic forks, and the springs are located on the outside of the tubes, either on the near end of the front wheel or at the top near the frame. This setup offers a really rudimentary functionality and is purely used for the vintage aesthetics. There really is no benefit for a Springer front end. The frame on choppers are usually highly modified enough other ways beyond altering the angle of the front end. These modifications create entirely new geometry for the motorcycle and changes the silhouette to something alien that challenges what a factory built motorcycle should look like. The top of the frame is usually heightened at a steep angle and the rear of the frame is often modified to become a rigid frame which removes the rear suspension. To combat the lack of suspension, choppers will sometimes use Springer seats. Choppers often have tall sissy bars as well. That way you have a place to strap down your bindle as you travel across the American landscape in search of life's greatest questions, including, but not limited to, why does my ass hurt so much when I ride this bike? So as you can tell, chopped frame equals chopper. It's probably where the name came from. But much like bobber style motorcycles, a chopper will usually be stripped of any parts deemed to be unnecessary by the builder. So that usually means deleting everything from the mirrors and turn signals to the front brake and outer primary cover. It is said that the front brakes are usually removed because they're ineffective at best and dangerous as worst when the forks are raked out as far as they are on a chopper. Some of the much more extreme builds will even use a jockey shifter, and that's where you use your foot to engage the clutch and switch gear position with your hand using a lever. There's something fascinating about the antithetical nature of the chopper motorcycle. Builders will put so much effort into making a bike as hard to ride as possible just because it's their God-given right as an American to do so. And that's actually a great segue into my next point. 
If you noticed, I refer to them as builders instead of riders because choppers are very much a builder's style of motorcycle. The experience is about building a unique, one-of-a-kind motorcycle as much or more than it is about actually riding them. A lot of these bikes are built just to be taken to shows or photographed for magazines, so all jokes aside, ripping on the impractical absurdity of the chopper, it is almost impossible to completely separate the rest of the motorcycling and choppers, and the people who build and ride them follow a complete different syllabus with unique benchmarks and expectations for excellence. The chopper motorcycle is an extension of the bobber. Bobbers became a popular style of custom motorcycle in the 40s and 50s as riders modified their bikes by stripping away excess parts to save weight and increase speed. Bobbers were typically less drastic than choppers and didn't do much in the way of extreme frame modification, which is a crucial aspect of the chopper and where its name is derived from. As interest in customization grew, the chopper became different differentiated from the bobber and builders became more focused on building a motorcycle to achieve a certain look rather than outrun their constituents on the salt flats. The earliest choppers were built from old Harley Davidson knucklehead or panhead motorcycles. These bikes were used by police at the time and builders were able to find them for cheap at auctions. While an air-cooled Harley engine might be what most people expect from a chopper, early builders used Triumph and even Honda engines as well. By the 60s, choppers were becoming so popular that the style had been solidified and companies were building and selling custom parts for chopper conversions. The earliest choppers did away with the fat 16-inch tires most American bikes came with at the time and replaced them with much narrower 19 or 21-inch wheels and tires. The floorboards were swapped for forward-mounted foot controls and the gas tank and lights were replaced with smaller parts as well. This era led to the popularity of custom paint and chrome. Motorcycles were painted with multicolored patterned or metal flaked paint jobs and stock parts were manually chromed or replaced with aftermarket chrome parts altogether. Now during this time, some of the most popular builders were creating regional styles for the chopper motorcycle. In San Francisco's Bay Area, Arlen Ness pioneered the Bay Area chopper. These bikes had low slung frames, raked out forks, and typically used Harley Davidson Sportster engines. The Sportster engine became one of the preferred engines for chopper builds because the engine and transmission share one unit, making it more compact within the frame and better suited for the stripped back look that many chopper builders want. Ness's choppers usually still use the rear suspension from the donor Sportster, making them a bit more comfortable to ride than a hardtail frame. Another shop called Denver's Choppers opened in San Bernardino in 1967, and the owners became famous for the Denver-style chopper. These choppers had more dramatic changes to their geometry with forks that were even longer than the Bay Area style and frames that were stretched and raised. Now we gotta talk about a pinnacle moment for choppers. In 1969, the film Easy Rider was released and considered to be hugely successful. The inclusion of chopper motorcycles in a film that received global acclaim made a small regional style of custom motorcycle a worldwide phenomenon. Choppers became a sought after style in Europe as well. The Swedish style chopper became a unique subgenre within the custom motorcycle world. Unlike American choppers, Swedish choppers were even more minimalistic and understated. What's the difference? between a Swedish style chopper and an Ikea bed frame, there are no motorcycles on your mom and I's wedding registry. The amount of custom chopper shops and fabricated parts multiplied exponentially during the 70s. This time period birthed the digger style chopper as well. This type of build shares the same general style of a chopper like a long raked fork and low slung rear, but they incorporate more fluidity into their design and bodywork. They sometimes make use of the distinct coffin shaped gas tanks as well, as older Harley Davidson knucklehead and flathead engines became older and harder to come by, many builders started incorporating other air-cooled engines into their builds, including the esteemed inline four from the Honda CB750. Man, you literally cannot talk about a single piece of motorcycle history without mentioning the CB750. You'd think a deep dive on choppers would be the furthest thing from what's considered to be the original superbike. But nope, here we are. Even today, the CB750 gets its little 25 seconds of glory. Like many motorcycle companies selling motorcycles today that reflect on the custom-built motorcycles of the past, like Cafe Racers, Bobber Scramblers, in the 80s, Harley-Davidson adopted some of the styling cues from these custom bikes and incorporated them into a soft tail line of motorcycles. The soft tail bikes, compared to the now defunct Dynas, use a monoshock style rear suspension that is built into the frame beneath the rider, which gives it the illusion of a hardtail rigid frame. 
HD started using a 21 inch front wheels and the soft tails as well to contribute to the chopper inspired look. Even Japanese manufacturers started incorporating some aspects of the chopper aesthetic into their cruiser bikes. Custom choppers definitely played a role in developing our expectations of a cruiser motorcycle. While you won't see 45 degree rakes on factory front ends, the use of forward controls, large front wheels and tall handlebars and low slung seats are all derivative of the chopper style motorcycle. Not only did choppers influence the style of certain factory motorcycles, it also contributed heavily to the popularity of motorcycle modification. While people have been modifying their bikes for as long as they've been riding on two wheels, chopper culture helped lead the popularity of mass-produced high-quality aftermarket motorcycle parts. In the 90s, CNC manufacturing and fab technology made it a lot easier to produce high-quality parts on a consistent basis. Companies like SNS grew in popularity for builders and modifiers who could now source every single part for motorcycle and essentially build a bike from the ground up using entirely aftermarket parts. Now, with improved tech and parts availability at the turn of the century, choppers became became more powerful and safer with better brakes and suspension, instead of a patchwork of random one-off fabs, choppers were able to be built to a modern standard. And then in the early 2000s, viewers were able to watch the custom chopper building happen from their living rooms. Choppers became all the rage for Y2K reality TV, with celebrity builders like Jesse James from West Coast Choppers and Paul Tuatel, the sons of the Orange County Choppers, middle class Americans now had a front row seat to witness a behind the scenes look at an authentic custom motorcycle building experience. And that of course is a joke. Like any piece of reality TV, these depictions were less than nuanced caricatures of motorcycle builders and chopper culture. While Discovery Channel devotees and middle class America at large ate it up, builders and riders who were immersed in authentic bike building culture were displeased. Shows like American Choppers convinced rich white dudes to spend tens of thousands of dollars on factory custom choppers that didn't bear much resemblance to the original chopper ethos or craftsmanship. As a result of the backlash towards reality TV chopper culture, thanks to the cyclical nature of trends and an access to infinite information on the internet, chopper culture has been revitalized in a way that is similar to what the founding fathers had intended. There is again a focus on hand-built, one-of-a-kind custom motorcycles that are akin to choppers built in people's backyards in the 60s and 70s, instead of the sterile, highly stylized bikes that celebrity builders can make in a multi-million dollar garage bankrolled by the Discovery Network. And that's kind of where choppers are left today. As much as I'm not really a cruiser guy, let alone a chopper guy, I can definitely say that I'm glad the norm core factory custom choppers are not that popular anymore. I can understand the appeal of tearing down a $2,000 sportster and building it up something cool with your buddies. Sure, why not? But buying a Big Bear Boss Hoss Big Dog Iron Horse Factory Chopper for like 40 grand is pretty cringe. But I'll give credit where credit's due. Choppers have had a significant cultural impact on motorcycling worldwide, more than any other form of motorcycling really. And that's pretty impressive. What do you guys think? Are choppers worth the hype? Or are you more of a Bob Job at Bike Night kind of guy? Thanks for watching the video and be sure to subscribe if you like what we're doing here on the channel. I wanted to give a special shout out to the Japanese Bosuzoku style chopper as well. Those are pretty sweet. And of course, if you want to find a chopper, all you got to do is go on Craigslist and there are plenty of these relics from the Y2K era TV choppers up for sale for pennies on the dollar. Hell, maybe I'll buy one of these choppers. Anyways, thanks again for watching. See you later. Fact, the song Coconut by Harry Nilsson has only one chord in the entire song, C7. It reached the number eight spot on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1972. Remember that next time someone tells you that music was better back in the old days. Goodbye.